So this is not going to be a, an amazingly revealing talk, but uh, I'm just going to share something that I've been doing lately when I've been making, um, making fixes and a few extra steps that I've been doing in order to try to avoid re regressions. <laughs> uh, I'm not actually presenting it, am I? All right. So uh, Cisco's always been really good at uh, running his office inter interoperability suite and finding problems, uh, regressions with, with bugs that I've had. And you know, so you know, most of the time before it hits stable, they get fixed. But it would be really nice if my name was not immortalized in a bugzilla with a regression flag on it. So um, I'm trying to uh, find better ways to do it. So the standard thing, of course, is uh, to research a problem, to write your patch, and make sure that make check runs and it finds no errors, and um, then you can try to patch it. But certainly, there should be something more that we can do. So in the example that I'm going to use today, at the top, we have uh, Microsoft Office, and you see a cell with no space on the bottom, but in LibreOffice, there's a space extra on the bottom. So one of the things you can do in uh, Microsoft Format is a conditional style or conditional formatting for upper and lower space. So if you're having this multiple, um, multiple paragraphs with the same style, then it will not use uh, put the space in between. But when you switch styles, then the, the space will go there. Okay? So obviously in this case, Microsoft is considering that the same style is being used or something like that. In uh, LibreOffice, of course, this is the last paragraph, so you would expect the space to be there, but in Microsoft it isn't. And so the theory then was, well, at the bottom of a cell, you just don't put in that conditional space. And it passed all the make checks and it passed all the uh, unit tests that we had attached to the bug report. And so, is that enough? But we don't want to just fix the document, we actually want to fix the problem. Okay. And so, uh, what I did is I added some debug output to it, and then I asserted to find any examples in our existing unit tests that would have been changed. Okay, so, um, we're saying don't add any space, but where are we actually adding space? And then I ran a make check. And so, of course, that's going through all of the existing unit tests that have been piling up over the years, looking for other documents that have the exact same situation that I'm trying to fix. Okay, so this is what I did. I just put in a debug statement so that I can see uh, as I'm running through these unit tests what's failing, uh, the difference in the value. Okay, and this is the part that was being added if it's a docx file and there was uh, some space on the bottom, then just do nothing. Okay? Instead of adding the space, do nothing instead. That matched ours. So now, instead of doing nothing, I'm asserting the fact that uh, I actually had a value there. Okay? I, I don't care if the space was zero already because zero plus zero is zero. So I don't care about that situation. I only care about the situation where I would have added a space below before, but now I'm adding nothing. Okay, so I get some debug output, I assert, and then running a make check will fail on one of the unit tests um, that, that match it or that I'm going to be affecting. Okay, and one of them uh, from writer test number seven matched my condition. And you can see on, the, on this cell here that actually there is space on rows uh, two and three on the bottom. So our theory of that we shouldn't add any space at all, ever, was wrong. Okay? It was incomplete. And so that led us to do a little more research into the problem, uh, create some of our own documents. And uh, this is the, what we came up with. So we have, we're using two different styles here, and they're configured identically. Okay? On one side, we start with one style and then end up with the normal style. On the other side, we start with a normal style and end with our, our handmade one. You, since they're identical configured, you would expect them to look the same. 
but they look completely different, right? So obviously there's something else at play here. And it turns out there's a special rule for, um, for, for using the default, the so-called default style, right? If you create any other, any other style works one way, but the default style works another way. Okay, so what are some of the lessons that I've learned uh, using this approach? Always verify that your certs work on the bug, on, on the example that you have, okay? At least for me, I easily get my assert lo logic wrong and I run this great big long make check and, uh, you know, it passes everything and um, then I go, what? I, no test at all and I try it on my own test and it doesn't work, so I, I got it wrong. Uh, also, adding debug output before the assert lets you identify uh, whether this is likely going to be a, a useful example to look at or not. Um, again, if, if, there, if you go through and there's no matching examples, you probably have the assert wrong. There's lots of documents in QA. Most of the time when I'm doing this process, I'm finding documents that help me out. Uh, if there's too many examples, so basically in everyone um, try to assert only on the more interesting or highly visible ones, right? So don't worry about a space of 10, worry about a space of 100 or more, something like that. So assert only on larger values that are visibly more significant. And um, you might be able to find an example that nicely exhibits what you're trying to fix, and you can use that as your unit test and avoid another load save operation by using an existing test. Uh, another lesson learned is just to delete the unit tests that you find and then run the assert again. Okay, that way you can make sure that you find all of the same, if there's multiple in the same test, you can find them all. And when you find one in a certain compartment, like uh, docx format, for example, then uh, just run each one of the checks in series, right? one after the other, instead of running the whole make check again, just make sure you go through that, whole, that one component, find all the bugs in it, and then run your make check again. Because obviously a make check takes a long time. And then finally, upload the patch with the assert and the deleted unit tests as a work in progress. So upload that onto Garrett as a form of documentation. So if you upload it as a percent work in process, then our build won't try to build it with all your debug stuff in it. It will simply be uploaded and left there for documentations. And also make sure that you put a reply in the comment uh, indicating that you're, I mean, it's just a patch site. You'll, you'll quickly lose it in the, um, it, it, you won't find it back if you don't put some documentation in it. Okay, so that is the end of my uh, speech, and if I have time, a little uh, minute or two left, then I can just show an example of me using it. Okay, so here is an example in Garrett where I have an entry here. So the previous patch sets contain debugging information. And so if I go to uh, one of the earlier patch sets, and then I can see the, I have documentation of which bugs matched my condition. So if I ever have a regression, I can go back and find some other examples of, uh, and other documents that I worked on. Okay, any questions, any feedback? Like I said, it's not an amazing uh, observation, but uh, hopefully it'll be, encourage you to focus a little more on avoiding regressions. So. And it does take time. I'm, I usually just, you know, at the end of the day, I just run and make check when we're having supper or something like that and uh, let, it, let it run then, because obviously it takes time. But I, I find it worthwhile, so. Anything? That's it, thank you. Thank you.